Hi, welcome back to this third video about cooking authentic Chinese food. When I started this video series a couple of months ago, I had just reached 750 different dishes that I prepared. Well, this being a year full of lockdowns and social distancing, I spent much more time at home and also wasn't able to, um, to travel to China for, for business and, and my personal travels. So I actually did many more dishes, much more cooking this year than I expected up front. So by the time that this video goes online on YouTube, I've already passed the 850 different dishes. This year alone, I cooked 300 different Chinese dishes. So in this third video, I'm going to share the cuisine, the cooking of a different region again. So what we've seen in the previous two videos is I've first shown you the cooking in the, uh, the book Every Grain of Rice by Fuxia Dunlop. And this, this is a cooking book with uh, dishes from different regions, but it mainly focuses on easy, simple home cooking. In the second video, we talked about this book, The Revolutionary Cookbook. And this is about Hunan cuisine, and you can view that in the second video. In this third video, we're going to go to a different part of China again. And the cool thing about the books by Fuxia Dunlop is that she normally focuses on one region. And in this case, we're going to talk about the book Land of Fish and Rice. Now, Land of Fish and Rice is a book that is mainly or is basically about the region of uh, Jiangnan. Now, you might not have heard of Jiangnan before, um, and I won't blame you because it's not a place that is uh, like a province or a town or whatever. No, it's, it's more like a region in, in China. And if you look at the, this map, then you'll see that Jiangnan is actually composed of the province of Jiangsu, the province of Zhejiang, the city of Shanghai, and even bits of the southern part of Anhui and the northern part of Jiangxi. Although most of the, uh, the dishes that you'll find uh, reference the cities of Shanghai, and Hangzhou, Suzhou, etc. So Jiangnan literally means south of the river. And the river in this case is the Yangtze River. The Yangtze River uh, is basically the river that runs north of the region of Jiangnan. And that's why it's called south of the river. So, and that includes all of the places that I just mentioned. Now, if you look at these different provinces, there's quite some really, really interesting places that you uh, will see on this map. For instance, if you, if you look at the uh, province of Jiangsu, you have Suzhou, you have Nanjing, you have Zhangzhou, uh, Zhenjiang. Zhenjiang is uh, famous for the uh, vinegar that's made there, the, also known as the Xinjiang vinegar. And you have Wuxi, which is also close to uh, somewhere between Nanjing and Suzhou. In Zhejiang, you also have a couple of very interesting places. You have Hangzhou. Hangzhou is very famous for the West Lake. It's also the uh, city where Alibaba is located. So uh, you find a lot of tech companies there. You have Shaoxing. Shaoxing is um, well known for its rice wine, Shaoxing rice wine. And you have Ningbo. It's more of a, a port city with lots of harbors. And then, of course, you have Shanghai. Well, most of you will be familiar with the city of Shanghai. Um, I myself, if you look at Jiangsu and Zhejiang, I spend quite a lot of time in those provinces. I spend quite a lot of time in Shanghai for work, uh, especially when I'm preparing the study tours that we do or when I'm taking people on, on those study tours, we normally go to, uh, to Shanghai as one of the cities that we visit. But if I have free time, I normally go to Suzhou or Hangzhou. These places have much more nature, much more history. They've got lots of temples. They've got lots of very impressive things. Um, and I feel more like being in China when I'm in these places than when I stay in Shanghai, which to me is just a very big modern city. So Hangzhou, if I go to Hangzhou, for instance, you have the, the beautiful West Lake, but you also have all of these tea fields and you have lots of pagodas around these, uh, 
around the lake and, and in these tea fields. Sujo, on the other hand, has beautiful gardens. Um, some of them with, with lots of rock gardens, uh, lots of uh, beautiful Chinese buildings. So I like to wander around these, these different places and I've visited Sujo a couple of times to go there. There's also lots of pagodas. There's lots of, lots of temples. And what's really interesting about Sujo is that if you stay in Sujo, it's a, a good place to sort of visit all of the water towns that you find around Sujo. And I myself have visited Mudu, Tongli and uh, Luzhe as three of the different water towns. And, and although these places tend to become quite um, touristic, with the mass tourism, of course, that's taking place in China, um, and sometimes it can be a bit hard to look beyond all of the restaurants and the souvenir shop. There's still a lot of history and a lot of old China to be seen in those places. Well, the same goes for, for Nanjing. Nanjing is also a city with a lot of history. Uh, of course, Nanjing uh, literally means the southern capital. So it was a capital of China for a while. It's got a, a very impressive city wall. I'm a sucker for city walls, so I really love to visit cities and, and towns that have their own city wall. But you also have really great musea, museums in Nanjing. So you have the uh, Taiping Museum, which focuses on the Taiping Revolution. You have uh, the Nanjing uh, Provincial Museum. And you also have, on a more darker side in the history of China, you have the Nanjing Massacre Museum which focuses on the uh, war with the Japanese and, and all of the um, atrocities that were committed when the Japanese took over Nanjing. So it's a region with lots and lots and lots of beautiful places and lots of history that I really like to travel in, uh, especially, like I said, going out of uh, Shanghai. Now, the cooking, the cuisine of this region is also very different from some of the other stuff I discussed in previous videos. In uh, Jiangnan cuisine, they try to focus more on the essential flavors of the ingredients. Uh, instead of like you, for instance, see in Hunan and in um, Sichuan, covering them with lots of spices and peppercorns and, and, and chilliness. What they want to do in uh, Jiangnan is, is to focus on the natural ingredients of these, uh, the natural flavors of these ingredients, which, which they call burn wei. Uh, they also are more focusing on gentle flavors, uh, qing dan, they call that in uh, Chinese. And if you ask the people from, uh, from Jiangnan, they often say that they find Cantonese food a bit too raw, a bit too wild, and Sichuan and, and Hunan Tsai, uh, cuisine from Sichuan and Hunan is simply too hot and the northern food uh, they quite often find too salty so they are more about refined uh, taste for their, their dishes. That doesn't mean that they sometimes don't use seasonings because uh, the, the seasonings like I said is, is used for framing the quiet beauty of uh, the ingredients themselves um, and they are supposed to take away some of the fishy tastes. So some of the tastes that are maybe less pleasant in meat and fish and, and other ingredients. So to do that, they normally use uh, seasonings that are not too strong. So like, for instance, the, uh, the Xiaoxing wine I mentioned before. They use ginger quite a lot to season the flavors. And they also use the white parts of spring onions quite often. Um, they don't tend to use a lot of garlic, though. Uh, there are some garlicky dishes, but uh, you won't find it in, uh, in these Jiangnan dishes as often as you see in uh, Sichuan or in Hunan. Now, this, this does mean that uh, Jiangnan food has some really, really excellent dishes, but it's personally not my favorite. I personally tend to prefer Hunan and Sichuan cuisine a bit more. Um, but in this book, uh, you will still find, depending of course on your taste, a lot of great dishes, even if you prefer like more spicy food like Sichuan or Hunan Tsai. Um, a couple of typical things that you'll find in Jiangnan cuisine are the following. First of all, you have so-called drunken dishes. Drunken dishes are dishes where um, the ingredients are cooked in wine. Normally a 
normally a very good rice wine. Um, you also, like I said before, there's quite some use of the uh, Xinjiang vinegar. It's an excellent vinegar, an excellent rice vinegar. It's dark, but it has a really smooth, almost sweet kind of taste. <clears throat> and talking about sweetness, um, there's also a lot of cooking with sugar and, and sweetness, especially in uh, Suzhou and in the Wuxi region. There's a lot of sweet dishes that you can find in this book that come from that region. What they also often do in China, they use um, Osmantus blossom. Uh, you can can see it here. Uh, it's it's not incredibly cheap, but it can be quite expensive. This is probably something like 10 euro for this little bag. Um, but it can give a really nice taste to some of your dishes. And what you can even do is you can turn it into your own syrup by adding water and sugar and, and let it, the flavor of the blossom soak in. So that's used quite a lot in Jiangnan, uh, in Jiangnan cuisine. Of course, there's a lot of seafood. Uh, Jiangnan is called the land of fish and rice, hence the uh, name of the book. Um, and you'll find a lot of seafood, especially in the Ningbo region, of course, which is at the coast. Furthermore, lots of fermented foods that are being used, especially around the region of uh, Xiaoxing, where uh, the uh, fermented uh, rice wine comes from. And there's also use of uh, pickled vegetables. So snow vegetable, uh, shue cai, is something that is often used in these dishes, but also meigansai, uh, which is made of pickled mustard greens, is found in some of these dishes from, uh, from Jiangnan. Now, another thing that you'll find in Jiangnan a lot are so-called red braised um, dishes, hongshao. Um, these are dishes where uh, you use a lot of sugar and soy sauce to uh, sort of color the ingredients, and that makes them red braised. And besides the soy sauce and the sugar, they also include some spices to, to give it a really good flavor. Now, for some of these spices you might be familiar with, there's the uh, star anise, uh, which is, um, is used one or maybe at most two uh, in, in preparing a, a full dish. You have uh, cassia bark, which is used, but I prefer to use uh, cinnamon, cinnamon sticks. Um, quite often they use black cardamoms, these little pots which you crack open and also include in the, uh, the, the cooking water when you're slow cooking. And finally, uh, you have licorice root, which also, of course, gives a, is a great flavor to uh, these red braised dishes. So what you'll find is that in you, you for instance, have uh, pork belly and you slow cook for about one and a half hour the meat with all of these different ingredients. And that makes them... Uh, red braised and red braised pork for instance can be found all over China but uh, it, the Jiangnan region especially Shanghai has their own different versions and it's normally always one of the favorites of uh, myself and, and my wife we tend to compare Chinese dishes to um, to Hong Shao Ro to red braised pork to see if we think it's like a really excellent dish or if it's okay it's good tasty but uh, maybe not one of the uh, the most excellent dishes. So you'll find, therefore, uh, some red braised dishes in the Land of Fish and Rice book. And one of them is the, a variation on the, uh, uh, the, the red braised pork belly, red braised pork, which uh, cooks it together with hard boiled eggs, which is really nice uh, addition. Uh, gives a, a different swing, a different um, variety to this uh, dish. You'll also find a very famous dish from uh, Hangzhou, which is Dongpo Ro. Dongpo is the name of a, a famous poet from the region. And Dongpo Ro is one of those drunken dishes where pork belly is actually slow cooked in a very good rice wine, also with sugar again. And it really melts on, uh, on your tongue when you, you eat this. And it's, but it's very, it's very uh, fulfilling. So you normally only get like one block of Dongpo Ro when, uh, when you eat it in uh, Hangzhou. The book also includes a recipe for uh, lion head meatballs. And lion head meatballs are basically big meatballs of uh, pork belly that you've chopped up yourself and then you created these meatballs um, and they are served normally uh, with uh, a, a, lettuce, a, a leaf of lettuce wrapped around it, which seemingly makes them look like a lion head. But the 
book also has a variation where you prepare your cook these um, pre-prepared lion head meatballs in uh, red braising liquid so and which then makes a red braised lion head meatballs one of our, the favorites from the book uh, again for for our cells what they also often do is they uh, make smoked fish in Jiangnan and smoked fish looks like fish that uh, has been smoked but it's actually uh, a red braised dish and uh, the interesting thing about this is that the uh, the red braising is often done with uh, soy sauces but it, it uses a tiny bit of dark soy sauce a very concentrated dark soy sauce which is not so much for flavoring but it's used for actually making the meat or making the ingredient darker and that's what gives uh, the uh, red braised fish its dark almost smoky like color another thing that you'll find in Jiangnan which is quite interesting are imitation dishes now sometimes these are dishes for Buddhists or Buddhist monks which can of course not contain any meat in this case, we, uh, we also see people in Jiangnan trying to imitate uh, dishes that have meat. For instance, there is the vegetarian meal uh, of vegetarian crab meat. Now, it, this doesn't contain any crab uh, whatsoever, but it contains potatoes, it contains, uh, contains carrots, it, I think it's got some vinegar in it as well. And the combination of this makes it the, the mouthfeel and the, the flavor a lot like crab. So another example which my wife really likes is the uh, vegetarian eels, uh, which are cooked in sweet and sour sauce. Now these are not really eels, these are mushrooms which are prepared in such a way that they have sort of the, the texture of, uh, of, a, of eels. So there's more dishes in the book, like for instance, um, a mock goose, a mock duck that you'll find, which is actually made with tofu skin and don't contain any meat whatsoever or any poultry whatsoever. So especially for vegetarians also, this might be a good alternative. So if we go through the book, like all of Fuchsia's books, the books are built up in different chapters. And what I'm going to do in this video, I'm going to run you through some of the favorites or some of the uh, dishes that are really worth mentioning that we found in this book. So let's start with some appetizers. So one of the appetizers that we really, really like, and you can eat this uh, cold, is Ningbo soy sauce greens. It's basically pak choy which is uh, slow-cooked uh, slow in uh, soy sauce. And then the pak soy gets really soft and it absorbs all of the soy sauce flavors. It's not the most beautiful dish to look at, but it's really, really tasty, even if it's uh, cold and if it's cooled down or at room temperature. Um, one of the things that I made for my wife is a Nanjing New Year salad. And uh, it turned out to be a real favorite. It basically contains all kinds of salad ingredients, um, like bean sprouts, it's got carrots, It's uh, I think it had some spinach in it, there's some tofu in it, and that's all sort of mixed together with a dressing. And uh, she, she really liked that as a cold dish, which is quite special for somebody that doesn't really prefer cold food. Another one that she really liked were the uh, shiitake, uh, mushrooms which are also slow boiled in in a broth and then absorb the the, the flavor and what you get is juicy um, shiitake mushrooms i'm a big lover of the lotus root like the the big root that you'll find in the mud under the lotus flower and one of the dishes that you find in this book is lotus root which has been stuffed with glutinous rice and then boiled now it makes the rice expand it gives the uh, lotus uh, a bit of a, a pinkish color and then again you um, put some really nice syrup over it and this is also a dish that you'll find quite often in shanghai restaurants if you uh, go and eat there but it's, uh, it's really nice it's normally served as a, a cool cold dish appetizer now we're big lovers of chinese dishes with aubergine with eggplant in them and this book has an appetizer, also supposed to be a cold dish, of aubergine, which is dressed with, uh, with some garlic, with some ginger, with some spring onions. And you heat up some oil and you pour that, that hot oil over 
these coverings and they release their flavor and you get this really, really nice aubergine salad. Um, one of the favorites uh, in the book for us. Another relatively easy one to make is this eight treasure spicy relish. You'll find a lot of eight treasure dishes in China. Eight is a lucky number, so that makes it a lucky dish. And in this case, it has tofu and it has um, green soybeans. It's got peanuts. Um, I couldn't quite remember what is in there, but it, it turned out to be a really, really tasty relish um, that you can serve with the rest of your dishes. Now, as I said, Jiangnan is not one of the of, of my personal favorites of cuisines. But there are some dishes in this book which are really, really excellent. And most of them can be found in the meat section. So sorry for all of the vegetarians, but for me, the best um, food was in, in the meat section. Let's run through some of these. Um, you have Ningpo pork with fermented tofu juices. Now, that, that, might be, that might sound a bit strange or a bit disgusting to some of you. As a matter of fact, fermented tofu, and I normally tend to use the, the red version, the red fermented tofu, is really nice. And it sort of has the flavor and the texture of some um, cream cheeses, uh, like maybe um, Danish blue or, or, or one of the, some, some French cheeses. So it's got this really strong flavor. But it works really well in some of the dishes, like for instance in this Ningbo pork with uh, red fermented tofu juices, where you use the juices and some of this fermented tofu to give flavor to the dish. Another really nice one is uh, this spare ribs dish, the wushi meaty pork ribs, um, which again use some, some also food coloring to give them this uh, really nice red appearance. It's a red yeast rice that is used to, to create this. But it's a very sweet dish. Like I said, Sujo and Wuxi are known for their sweet dishes. And this is a typical sweet uh, dish from the region. Um, Tangsu Liji has always been one of the, my favorite Chinese dishes. I used to eat it a lot um, when I was living in Xi'an. But I also ordered it everywhere I went throughout China. And the interesting thing is that you get very different versions of this dish, which basically is uh, made from pork tenderloin. And uh, it is then uh, deep fried and covered in most of the time a very sweet sauce, Somet sometimes tomato based, sometimes not. This is the version as they prepare it in Hangzhou, the sweet and sour pork. It's different from the Cantonese, which most of the time have like gulao ro, uh, which also sometimes include pineapple. So it's a totally different dish but it's, it's still one of my favorites. And this Jiangnan version is definitely also worth trying. Another thing that was interesting to eat is uh, this pork belly, which was chopped up by hand and then steamed with the salty yolks of um, salty duck eggs, which give a lot of flavor to this, um, this pork dish. Quite interesting to do. Now, talking about eggs and, and poultry, um, this specific book, I, I, chicken is one of my favorite meats, and this specific book has quite a few dishes. Not all of them are personal favorites. Again, I tend to go to Sichuan dishes more often, or Lazaji, uh, like the, the chili chicken in, in those regions. But there's a couple of dishes that are really interesting that I should mention here. The most important one is a very famous dish called Hangzhou beggar's chicken. Now in Hangzhou, if you travel in Hangzhou, you might see these people in the street that have like this, this pot, this oven, which they stoke up, which they heat up, and it's got these clay wrapped packages inside. And that's actually beggar's chicken. So if you go to a restaurant and you order beggar's chicken, um, it's open up and either in, in lotus leaves or in plastic, it's got this chicken that has been sort of baked um, inside this mud. Uh, now, this was something, this was the, one of the uh, dishes that I postponed most in actually preparing because I found it very intimidating and it seemed very difficult to do. But I finally overcame my fear and I decided to make this dish. So what you do, you get all of the ingredients. Of course, you have a full chicken and you have a lot of flour also because 
when cooking at home, you don't bake it in mud, you actually bake it, bake it in dough. So you first of all, you prepare the whole chicken, you marinate the chicken, and then what you do is you put the chicken in the middle of some big lotus leaves, which you soaked in water to make them more supple. And so you can, what you can do is you can fold those lotus leaves around this chicken, you bind it together, and then you wrap the whole chicken, the whole package, into this, uh, this dough. And then you put it in the oven for a couple of hours. But when it comes out, the dough will have hardened. And when you take it to your uh, to the table, then you can actually uh, unpack it, which you will see in this video. chicken. <laughs> Yeah, Yay! Now what you end up with is a really succulent, very tasty chicken. It's normally stuffed with spring onions or with leeks to give it a bit more flavor. Uh, and it's really an adventure to make, but also to unwrap and eat. It's almost like it's Christmas every day if you eat beggar's chicken. So don't feel too intimidated by this dish. You should definitely go and, and try this out. Another interesting thing, uh, there's an, 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 uh, an omelet dish, uh, which you can find in, uh, in this book, Land of Fish and Rice, which involves uh, cutting up some pork into tiny strips, roast, as uh, they call it in uh, Chinese. And then um, you bake it with uh, some egg, some, some whipped eggs, and you pour some really hot oil into the middle. And that makes this egg what they call galloping. So what you end up with is a galloping eggs um, with slivered pork. It's like a really fluffy omelet uh, with some, some meat inside. And one of the things that we really liked in this dish. Now, another interesting thing to make from this book is Shanghai golden egg dumplings, which you see here in this picture. In this case, they are sort of served on a stew of Chinese cabbage, uh, but they're basically just little omelets, little eggs folded with some meat, some minced pork inside with some spices. Um, that might sound like very tiresome, and a lot of work to make, especially to create these little eggs. But if you can find one of these, these little pans in, in a shop near you, it's not that difficult because you basically put some, um, some egg, some whipped egg in it, and halfway through, you just put some, some meat on it, you fold it, you press it closed, and then you create this dish. Um, it's, it's, again, it's a favorite of my wife's to, uh, to have this. In, there's two different varieties in the book. Now, there's also some duck dishes in this cooking book. I'm personally not a big fan of duck. Um, I do like the uh, Beijing uh, roasted duck, Beijing duck, Beijing uh, kao ya. But maybe it's the quality of the duck that we get here, but I've never really uh, enjoyed a lot of duck dishes that I made at home. So. Uh, for the people that do like duck, there is also quite a few duck dishes in the land of fish and rice. Talking about fish, let's have a look at some of the fish and seafood dishes. Now, again, I personally don't prefer the fish dishes in, in this book much over the Hunan and the Sichuan fish dishes. Um, but there are still some that I really enjoyed myself. The thing is that uh, when I cooked some of these dishes at home and I compared them to what it's really supposed to look like when you order it in China, it can be quite frustrating and, and, and it puts you back into your place as an amateur cook. 
Now, one of the things, for instance, that we really liked is this fish in vinegar sauce. Now, what I did is I used some fish fillets. But if you actually order something like this in Hangzhou, this is what it looks like. It's really, really beautiful. It's um, in Hangzhou. It's called the West Lake vinegar fish, and uh, it's it's one of the highlights of the, the cuisine of the city. Now, this is another dish that I made, which uh, is called um, squirrel fish. Now, it looks absolutely terrible in this picture. It was quite tasty, nevertheless, but it definitely is not what it's supposed to be. And after having made this and after traveling back to uh, to Suzhou and Nanjing, I ordered this dish a couple of times in the province of Jiangsu. And then you get to see what this is really supposed to look like. It's really supposed to be like this tail of a squirrel. And what they do is they, they cut the, the meat of the fish in, uh, in a square of a grid pattern and then they sort of fry it so that it stands up and then they cover it in this this sweet and sour sauce it's a really really good dish but as you can see it's a bit difficult to make another dish that i can really recommend from the land of fish and rice are oil exploded prawns of course no chinese cooking book is uh, complete without some tofu dishes and in this case in Jiangnan, they quite often use tofu sheets, which are like pressed tofu into uh, more thicker layers, uh, thin uh, layers of, of tofu, but thicker than the tofu skin, which is like dried or paper thin uh, tofu, which are used both in some of the, uh, the muck meat dishes, um, but also in some uh, some other dishes. So, for instance, the tofu skin can be used to make these Buddhist vegetarian tofu rolls, which you'll find a recipe of in the book. And the tofu sheets, the tofu sheets can be cut into ribbons, and then you can make something like tofu ribbons with salt pork and green pak choy, which you see in this picture. The book also has some dishes with silken tofu, or dohua, or donyao as they call it in Chinese, which is a really soft, almost custard-like tofu, uh, which you can chop up, you can boil it uh, a bit and chop it up and then serve it with uh, different uh, seasonings. And it's a really nice dish as also an appetizer or maybe as part of uh, your breakfast. Vegetables. Vegetables are quite interesting in this book, Land of Fish and Rice, because there's a lot of vegetables that you'll find in different regions in China. In this specific book, you'll find lotus root dishes. You'll find one of my personal favorites, a really uh, great vegetable that I hadn't really uh, had before. Also never ordered it in China because I didn't know about it. I now know about it, um, Jiao Bai. So I will definitely order it the next time I visit China. But it's called uh, water bamboo. It's also called wild rice stem. And in this video, you can, can see what it's like if you actually peel it. Uh, it looks like maybe a bit of bamboo. Of it. It's got these husks, these leaves, which you'll also see in uh, in corn. But if you pull pull that away, you have this really nice white, soft texture, and you can slice that up and you can uh, uh, combine it with meat dishes. In the Hunan book, there's uh, for instance um, a dish where they combine slices of wild rice stem or water bamboo with um, uh, stir fried. Uh, beef but in this book we'll also see that there's a, a, a dish where it's cooked in soy sauce it's really really nice other things that you'll find in this book that you might not be familiar with is edible uh, chrysanthemum leaves you'll fi find uh, celtus i haven't been able to actually get hold of this so i haven't been able to prepare those uh, dishes which use celtus but it is a, quite a typical um uh, quite a typical vegetable. Some dishes use lily bulb uh, pieces. You have flowering chives, which are like garlic chives, but they are they, they are actually flowering. And you have taro, which is a bit like a potato, but much more slippery. And it's quite a nice ingredient uh, to some of these dishes. Now, what they quite often do in Jiangnan is just add a bit of meat to uh, the vegetables to give it a bit more flavor so you need to uh, be careful also in china if you're a vegetarian when you're ordering uh, vegetable dishes it might still have some meat in it so but in these cases you can quite 
often simply emit it when you prepare this yourself at home. Now, like I said, some of these ingredients can be quite hard to find. Um, there's a couple of things that are in this book that I still haven't prepared. As you can see, all of these little stickers are dishes that I haven't made yet. So I've made most of these dishes, but there's still something like 40 left that I haven't made because some of the ingredients are a bit harder to find. But if you keep an eye on uh, the shelves of your Chinese supermarket, you might be able to find most of these ingredients eventually. Just a couple of other examples of how vegetables are used. Magical radishes uses the big white Asian radishes, radishes. not the uh, small red ones that we tend to eat, but big white ones that in Japanese are called daikon. Um, and these are sort of also red braised uh, and my wife really liked this. I'm, I'm not a big radish fan myself. Some dishes also use wheat gluten. Um, the book even has a recipe how you can prepare your own wheat gluten and it's, it's much more tasty than the reputation that wheat gluten have here in the West. Another example is soupy Chinese cabbage with salt pork. And here we have an example where uh, you create a salad with carrot, with lotus root, which you can recognize by these beautiful patterns of holes when you slice them, and lily bulb. That's the uh, little white things that you also see in, in this dish. Um, so another typical Jiangnan dish. And this is uh, the taro, which I described. This is the uh, potato-like vegetable or root maybe, in this case, it's combined with uh, wind-dried sausage. And last but not least, here's a dish which you can make with its wild rice stem or water bamboo, where you stir fry it in, in soy sauce and you add some stock and you let it simmer for a while and it absorbs all of the different flavors, a really, really nice vegetable. The book also has some soups and soups normally in China are uh, served at the end of a meal instead of at the beginning of a meal as we are used to in the West. And a couple of really nice soups in this book are the crab meat, tomato and potato soup that you'll see here. Um, one of the highlights I can tell you from this book. Uh, there's a soup which uses that dohua, that silken tofu, cuts it in tiny little slices. You let it slide into some uh, broth which you've thickened with some uh, some potato starch and it creates this dish what they call monks a monk wins tofu thread soup there's also a very nice soup that uses silk and tofu again but then in combination with uh, spinach and creates this dish with beautiful green and, and white specks and another really nice one is a thick fish soup which you see here in uh, in this picture um, and turned out to be really, really tasteful as well. Now rice, of course, land of fish and rice. We've seen the fish, we got the rice as well. There's lots of different recipes for different types of congee. And the favorite of my wife from this book, I'm not a really big congee fan, but the favorite of my wife from this book is this black glutinous rice congee, which actually takes some normal rice, some glutinous rice and some black glutinous rice. And if you make in, by boiling them for about one and a half hour, a congee out of this, it's got this black purple like color um, and it's really, really nice according to my wife. Of course, uh, another favorite from the region, which you can also find in Every Grain of Rice, the other cooking book by Fuxia, is a Yangzhou fried rice. And normally when we have friends over for dinner, I don't serve normal white rice, but I always make a, a large portion of Yangzhou fried rice because it just looks a lot more colorful with the spring onion and little pieces piece of shrimp, chicken, ham, and, and also some egg in it. So it just looks much better on the uh, dinner table. But things can also be quite easy and simple sometimes. One of the things that you can do with some leftover rice is to create some fried rice and to add some soy sauce, which makes it really tasty and is really, really easy to make, of course. Another special mention that I need to give is rice cake. There's a couple of rice cake recipes. Rice cake is basically uh, rice that's been sort of pounded into uh, thick paste and then sliced. 
and you can find it in different forms in Chinese supermarkets. In this case, this rice cake uh, is turned into an English breakfast by Fuxia. So it's not a Chinese dish, but it's a nice interesting fusion where she also combines it with, with egg and bacon uh, and some vegetables. And it turned out to be remarkably nice when we prepared this. Noodles. Now, I'm a really, really big noodle fan. Um, I, like Western, uh, I like noodles from the north, from, from the south, like Sichuan. Um, I lived in Xi'an where you have Biang Biang Mian uh, and you have different other types of, uh, of noodles. So I'm a real big noodle fan. But uh, unfortunately, in this specific book, uh, there were no real favorite noodle dishes of me. I, I tend to go back to the, the Shanxi, Xi'an and the Sichuan noodles uh, or, or noodle dishes like Jiajiang. Jiajiangmian. But I still want to mention a couple of interesting things that you'll find in this chapter of the book. First of all, there's stir-fried sweet potato noodles. Now, these are quite slippery, translucent noodles. Um, I don't really like them that much, but my wife likes them. And you can make like really interesting noodle dishes where it's, it's more like the, the, the noodle is not like the main thing, but it's like one of the ingredients fighting for attention uh, together with tofu and peppers and other things. Um, the book also has a recipe for cat ears. It's like these little pasta-like nuggets that you boil uh, and they tend to look a bit like cat ears. And there's a very rustic, like rural recipe for rustic dough regal soup with pickled greens. Uh, it's a very easy dish. Uh, it's, it's a bit hard work to make because you need to make the dough and then you need to skim off bits with, uh, with a knife or with uh, a chopstick when you sort of pour it into the soup and you get these wriggles which then sort of harden when they boil with the rest of the soup. Um, not one of my personal favorites, but a really interesting thing to, uh, to make. Finally, of course, uh, one of everybody's favorites are the xiaochu, or the little snacks and the dumplings. This is definitely one of the highlights of the book, the Shanghai potsticker buns. You basically create these, these buns filled with pork, um, and on, on top they've been steamed, but on the bottom uh, they've actually been baked. So they have, they have a, a dark baked hard underside and the top side has been steamed by also pouring some water in and then covering it with a lid. It's really really delicious. Now Shanghai is of course also known for its Xiaolong Bao. Uh, strange enough in this book they are called Xiaolong Manto uh, but Xiaolong Bao are like these, the soup dumplings and I've always been very interested to learn how they get the soup inside those dumplings, how they do that. Um, I won't tell you the secret of making Xiaolong Bao it is in this book, but it's surprisingly easy and it gets you great results. So you can make your own Xiaolong Bao at home, your own soup dumplings. There's also, of course, a wonton recipe. Uh, wonton is also one of my uh, favorite dishes. And in this case, it's a Jiangnan type of wonton with pork and vegetables. And if you are into steamed buns, I don't like steamed buns uh, myself a lot. Um, I've always been more of a fan of jiaozi, the dumplings, than baozi, the steamed buns. But there's six different recipes for steamed buns with different kinds of fillings that you can find in this book. Now, as you've already noticed, there's also some sweet dishes that are popular in this region. And one of them is the eight treasure uh, rice pudding or eight treasure rice cake. Um, where you have like a sweetened cake with sugar in it, with some uh, coconut oil, with red bean paste, and then different types of dried fruit and nuts. Um, I already made a version of this, but in this case, uh, there's a Shanghai version, which is a bit different. So it's interesting to make. This is a nice one, pearly rice balls with sweet glutinous wine. It's sweet glutinous rice wine that has, still has a rice in it. And you combine it with balls of uh, glutinous rice that you also prepared. It's a really nice sweet dish. And my wife really likes the silver ear fungus soup that you see here. Now, silver ear fungus is a really typical, quite a beautiful type of fungus that is dried. And when you soak it and then you slow cook it for a while, it sort of falls apart into these 
uh, translucent bits, which you can then combine again with some uh, some rice from the sweet glutinous rice wine and some goji berries, which you see here. Also in this dish, it has that uh, osmanthus blossom that I showed you previously. So you see it return here. Another personal favorite is tangyuan or glutinous rice balls, which in this case are um, filled with black sesame stuffing. Uh, these are quite often eaten in China during one of the days of the Chinese New Year's festival. And uh, another return of the rice cake. In this case, you, uh, you deep fry it and then you combine it with some powdered sugar and some, uh, some seaweed and you get this uh, sweet Ningbo rice cake with seaweed. Also a really nice dish. Now quite interesting also in this book, Land of Fish and Rice, is that it contains quite a lot of drinks um, that you can make from fruits, like creating your own like flavor tea, uh, fruit flavored teas, or uh, some different types of juices. And to give you a couple of examples, there's ginger tea with brown sugar, there's jujube and ginger tea, there's a dried Chinese plum and hawthorn infusion, which is quite nice. And there's warm pumpkin juice with honey. There's also carrot juice and sweet corn juice, which uh, will show you that making juices out of vegetables can be quite nice. And uh, this is something really special for this land of fish and rice book. Also, there's a recipe to make your own fresh soy milk from dried soybeans. We tried it. Um, let's just say that a few hours after drinking this fresh soy milk that you've made, you shouldn't sit close to a fire. I'll leave it at that. The book finally concludes with some basic recipes for making your own, uh, for instance, your own wheat gluten, uh, and your own stocks and other ingredients that you use in other recipes in the book. And that sort of wraps up everything that you'll find. Now, what is my personal opinion about this book? As all of Fuchsia Dunlop's book, books, it's a really, really great cooking book. I have many, I've, I've got about 10, 15 different Chinese cooking books now, and none of them is as good as those that Fuchsia writes. It's got lots of information. It starts out with lots of information about the region, about the cuisine and the history, which gives you a nice, nice context to start cooking in. It's got big pictures of most of the dishes. Um, it's got a list of all of the basic ingredients also in the back of the book. Although unlike uh, her other book, Every Grain of Rice, it doesn't actually have pictures of these ingredients. It refers you to the website where, you, where it says you can find pictures. I haven't been able to find them quickly on the website. So I think that's a bit where this book is lacking compared to her previous book, Every uh, Grain of Rice. But it does have very detailed descriptions about the different ingredients and some informational backgrounds. Uh, every recipe comes with a personal story about the dish or about where she first ate it and who taught her how to prepare it. So that's also creates quite a lot of context and backgrounds for these individual recipes. Um, and the recipes themselves, why I like them so much, they're like clear about the ingredients. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed about other cooking books is they might tell you in the ingredient list they, how you need to prepare them, but uh, which sometimes can create a bit, of, a bit of stress if you've overlooked something and then you find that you need to chop something up in a certain way. But in Fuchsia's book, it, she just gives you the ingredients and in the recipe itself, she tells you step by step how to prepare and how to actually uh, cook um, a specific dish, which I find much more pleasant way of following her instructions. Now, if you look at the book, as you can see, it's been well used. It has about 200, approximately 200 recipes, but also variations of specific recipes. And on top of that, you have some recipes for making basic ingredients. So let's say there's about 200 dishes that you can make with this specific book. I myself have made about 160. Like I said, there's some that I'm still looking for the uh, ingredients for. There's also some that I I know I would probably won't like, so I haven't made them, like some of the duck dishes. Um, but you'll get 200 dishes and you'll find a lot of stuff that you'll definitely like in here. Now, if you compare this to um, some of the other books, 
Like I said in the first video, what we normally do is we tend to rate every recipe with green, yellow and red. Green being extremely delicious, yellow is like good, delicious, and red is I don't ever want to eat that again. And by looking at the number of green dishes, we normally know what, what our favorite cooking book or our favorite region is. So if you look at every grain of rice, we have about 20% of green recipes in here. Now, that's not to say that this is not a good book. It's a really good book because it tells you how to make simple dishes. But some of the most excellent dishes in Chinese cuisine just take some a bit more work. So that's, that's why this has mostly uh, yellow, uh, uh, yellow dishes, but uh, about 20% of really excellent dishes. This revolutionary cooking book has a score of about 30% for us. So more really interesting dishes. And that's about the same as this book. It's also around 30% of all the recipes that we find here uh, that we really like. And it's mostly is the meat dishes, some appetizers, most of the things that you've uh, seen in this video, in the pictures. Um, so it's a good book. It's got great stuff, but it's not our favorite. Our favorite is one that I will discuss in the next video. And that has a score that's somewhere about 35 to 40% of all of the dishes we gave a green rating. Until then... Go and get yourself this book. Go and try out some uh, Chinese authentic cuisine, which is very different from what you will get in uh, your local Chinese restaurants. And if you like these videos, give it a like, follow our channel. We, uh, we don't only uh, make cooking videos, we also make videos about uh, other things in, in China. Um, and Below you can also find all of the links to uh, articles or websites and uh, some of the previous videos that we made. So I hope you enjoyed this and see you again for the next video. Thank you.